Urabashi. Dem brande de she di arabaku she da ki roba ke de ra she de de rababa ku shi araba ke de ora ma ke de rababa sho roti arama ke she brababa ku shi araba ke ena ku she da ra ki di araba ku she ora ba sho ra ke victory in the name of Jesus victory in the name of Jesus breakthrough in the name of Jesus turnarounds in the name of Jesus signs wonders and miracles in the name of Jesus. Let 2024 be a year like no other in the life of every victorious believer that knows their authority, that knows the power of Jesus Christ that resides in them. I thank you, Father, that we are a people of power, a people of power, victory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to do offering time. We're gonna, it's a free will offering uh, to, to bless Brother Gary. So if you need an envelope, put your hands up. Uh, one of the ushers will come by and, and uh, give you an envelope. Uh, and, and while the ushers are passing out the envelopes, and while you guys are filling them out, we're just going to go over a couple of quick announcements for you guys, okay? Uh, so the ways to give, you can e-transfer. Uh, there, there's a payment terminal at the back table, at the book table, if you want to give electronically. Um, lots of ways to give. <laughs> so I'm very excited. I'm very excited this morning. I, 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 didn't, I didn't sleep much last night. I'm, I'm just excited for today. You know, there, there's a book table back there with a ton of information. I was actually blessed this morning by one of our brothers. I was looking at one of the books and I said, you know what, I'm going to have my wife uh, get me this book later. And he's like, how about I get it for you? I was like, oh, praise the Lord. You know what, those are the type of things that happen to givers all the time. Praise the Lord. Givers always have little testimonies like that. And I never, I'm always like, Lord, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you, brother, for doing that. Uh, so also, Pastors, you are invited. There's a luncheon, 11, uh, 11.30 on Thursday after the morning service. Your wives are invited as well. If your wife is with you, she is welcome to come with you. We, we don't want you guys doing things apart. Um, but there is a sign-up sheet at the back. So if you guys would take a moment, sign up, just so they can get a rough idea of how many people are coming. And I think that's it. I don't, I think I'm just going to skip that for now. Yeah, okay, we're skipping that one for now. All right, you know, um, this morning I was just sitting there talking, and I said, you know, Lord, I said, there's something about giving. You know, the Bible even actually calls giving a ministry. That'd be a great ministry to be known for. There's chapters in the Bible that talk about people's giving. Do you think that's important to God? Paul, Paul wanted to congratulate the people for their giving so they would get a blessing in return. There's a blessing in your giving. I love giving. That was the one area that me and my wife had problems on the beginning because I wasn't a giver. See, victory in the name of Jesus is victory in every area. And when I started to get the victory in giving and breakthrough, let me tell you, things radically changed. Doors started opening. Blessings started coming. I mean, God uses people to bless you. So don't ever think that we're trying to get your money because we're not. God's trying to give you an opportunity where he can bless you and he can multiply it back to you. That's what it's about. We want to bless the man of God. We want to bless them when they come, because I'll tell you something about blessing, about giving. It shows your heart. God so loved that he gave. Giving is out of a loving relationship. Give honor where honor is due. And a great way to show honor is with high honor gifts. Paul, he got, he got loaded down with high honor gifts. So we want to honor the man of God, but we also want to honor our father by showing him our heart through our giving. Everybody set? Everybody have their envelopes? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I have come, and so has everybody else, with a great expectancy for a move of your spirit in this room. I thank you, Lord, for wisdom and revelation that comes forth from your word. I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit speaks through Brother Gary and touches each and every one of us as you did last night. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, that needs will be met 
Expectations will be met. I thank you, Lord, that these things happen today in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Gary, hope it's yours. All right. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Well, this is the day the Lord hath made. We're not going to gripe and grumble and murmur. We're going to be glad. Amen. Hallelujah. And rejoice. Hallelujah. I tell you, I love this group of uh, people who come together, all of you. You know how to worship God. Amen. I appreciate you coming and being actively involved when we worship God, when we pray. Uh, it's just wonderful. I want to thank you for that. Thank you for your pastors uh, providing this opportunity for all of us to come together uh, to worship God, to receive from the Holy Spirit, and to participate in what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I believe that we can make a significant change in the atmosphere in this area and beyond this area. I'm thoroughly convinced of it. Thoroughly convinced. More convinced now than I have been ever in my life, that we can make a change. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, Jesus in Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter, I'm not going to turn there right now, that's not my starting point, but in Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter, you know the story, Jesus was in his own hometown of Nazareth, and he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he found the place wherein it was written. He opened the scriptures and began to teach. Now, you would think people would be blessed by what Jesus said. But they were not blessed. They were aggravated. And they said, is this not Jesus? You know, he ran up and down the streets with our kids. He played with our kids. His dad's a carpenter, owns a shop down the road. Is this not Jesus, the carpenter's son? Are not his brothers and sisters here with us? And they were offended. Offended by what he said. So Jesus, it went on to say, he could there do no mighty work. Think about that. John 3.34 says, Jesus had the Holy Spirit or the anointing without limitation, without degree. That's why we see the amount of miracles that took place in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, amazing things that took place. He had the anointing without any limitation, without any degree. Now we have the spirit or the anointing by measure. So when we come together, I want to talk about that later, there is a collective or corporate anointing that there is potential for that. And when that potential is there, then God can do greater things. He can manifest himself in a greater way. So Jesus could there do no mighty work. It does not say he did not want to. You understand this is Jesus' hometown. And he's natural. He's both the son of God, the son of man. He has natural feelings like we do. So, you know, you obviously want to bless people in your hometown. He could not. Now that throws off a lot of theologians. Because a lot of theologians believe that Jesus lived and ministered as the divine son of God. That he performed all his miracles as the divine son of God. Well, if that's the case, then Jesus had no right to tell us in John's gospel, the 14th chapter, the works I do, you'll do. Right? and greater works than these. There's no way that we could do the works Jesus did because we do not, we could not do them as the divine son of God. So obviously he did them as a man anointed. We know that. He said in Luke chapter 4 that he was anointed. He returned in the power of the spirit. He was anointed. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, hallelujah, to preach the gospel. And so Jesus could there do no mighty work. That means he had no miracle. No one was raised from the dead. No working of miracles in operation. 
No outstanding miracle took place in Nazareth. Think about that. And here is Jesus, the Son of God, who had the anointing without any limitation or degree. So, you know, our thinking is that God can do whatever he wants to do. No, we have to change that thinking. He's limited by what we do. He's limited. And again, that goes against a lot of theological training and most of our universities, biblical universities and Bible schools, uh, those that are, you know, we consider universities or four-year Bible colleges, and there are many good ones. Don't misunderstand me. I attended one, major denominational Bible school, not Rhema, but another one. Uh, I attended for a degree. And uh, even in that particular school, what's taught in systematic theology is an undertone of what we would call sovereignty, absolute sovereignty mentality. It's even in many of our worship songs today. Now you have to understand, when you sing something, you're confessing something. Huh? What if you sing, you're confessing, and what you say affects your spiritual life? Right? Well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I know there's a song out there like that. I'm not being critical, but the Lord does not give and take away. That's a quote from Job, right? Job was the oldest. It's the oldest book in the Bible, not written chronologically. It's the oldest book. You understand the first five books of the Bible written by who? Moses. Moses lived after Job. Long time after Job. Job was prior, probably, they think, to Abraham. He lived before Abraham. So you understand there was very limited knowledge of God. The only knowledge of God they had was passed down uh, verbally. Methuselah lived to Noah. That's a long time, right? And so, so Methuselah could tell stories. I mean, actual, this is what I experienced, right? Not, not secondhand. I didn't read this on the book. I didn't watch it on YouTube. But I mean, this is real. And so Adam lived 900 and some years. Methuselah lived all the way to Noah. So they passed down everything verbally, orally, until lifespan became shorter. Then God instructed them to write everything down so it could be passed down from one generation to the next. And so... Uh, you know, we have, uh, like I said, we have a, a sovereignty mentality uh, where it's in everything, even songs, like the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, like I said. He doesn't do that. All you have to do is read the New Testament. Every good, every perfect gift, James said, comes down from the Father. Right? Every good, every perfect gift comes down. There is someone who takes away. His name is Satan. Not God. Don't confuse the two. You know, I remember reading Billy Graham said one time that he had to make a decision. Uh, and, uh, you know, Billy Graham, of course, probably one of the most outstanding ministers of the gospel in our generation that, that was here living on the earth. Uh, I don't know how many people listened to his messages, how many presidents he influenced. Greatly used by God and a, a, a wonderful man, husband, uh, lived a moral life. No one could say anything against Billy Graham. Thank God for him. He said, you know, I had to make a decision in my life that God was good and the devil was bad. That sounds oversimplistic, but you know, we have to get to that point. Otherwise, you're confused. You don't know whether good things or bad things come to you, if it's from God or not. If, if, if you think bad things come from God, then you're not going to resist God. Right? You're not going to resist those things. So uh, Job made that statement. He was, it was limited knowledge. He thought that. But if you read through the book of Job, and actually the whole book of Job was about a nine-month period, not 90 years, about a nine-month period. And if you read the last chapter of Job, God blessed him twice as much as he had before when he corrected his theology. And that's all there is. God's not mad at people. Once we correct our theology and we understand who God is, 
we get in right relationship with him and say the same things he is saying, then we receive from him. Very simple. So, uh, sovereignty mentality says that everything that happens in this life or this world, good or bad, that happens to believers or Christians, is either directly from God or permitted by God. It is His perfect will or plan for our lives. Now, uh, those who believe in that, when bad things happen, their explanation for that is, well, you know, God's wisdom is way beyond ours. And so we just trust Him. Well, that covers everything, right? You don't have to explain why bad things happen if you have that answer. Amen. It's just, well, just trust God, you know, in His wisdom. You know, His knowledge far exceeds us, and it does. I'm not saying it does not. It does. But in His wisdom, you know, He knows that, you know, this trial or this test or this sickness or this disease at some point will bring glory to Him. Well, if that's true, then Jesus was doing His best to take glory away from His Father by healing all who were sick. Right? Matthew 8, 16 said, When even was come, they brought unto Him many that were possessed by spirits, and He cast out the spirits with His word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. No, we have to understand, and you know, people, when we read the Old Testament, unfortunately, many times it's translated in a way that it implies that God uh, is actively involved in judging or destroying people. There are certain verses in the Old Testament, and people, you know, for some reason, they'll find those verses. They can't find the good ones. But they'll find every neg negative one there is. I remember in China, you know, we, uh, I don't know why it is, but the Chinese would ask me questions that no one ever asked in my life. That's why I'm probably good at Q&A. They would ask the most impossible questions. Where's that verse at? I mean, they could quote every destructive verse in the Old Covenant. I said, why don't you focus on the blessings? Amen. So you have to understand that the tenses many times, Dr. Robert Young, who wrote Young's uh, commentary, and I have, uh, you can't find that anymore, but uh, many of the verb tenses are translated causative. God did this, God did that, when in, in actuality they're permissive tense verbs. So you understand if you crawled up on the top of this building and uh, you were working on the top of this building and somewhere or another you did something wrong and you fell off, you broke your leg, you would not say, God broke my leg. No. Right? Through carelessness or whatever, you fell off the building. Now, gravity, the law of gravity, which God created, huh? To keep you on this planet, so you're not just floating around out there. Some people float anyway. <laughs> I don't know where they are. They're floating. But to keep you down, grounded, right? Gravity is a good thing, not a bad thing. So, however, the law of gravity went into effect. God created that law. You fell off the building. You broke your leg. You wouldn't say, well, God did that because he made the law of gravity. No. The same is true in the Old Covenant. God gave Israel laws for their benefit and protection because there's an enemy. So if you stay inside the confines of these laws that I give you, I'll bless you. If you get outside the confines of what I tell you to do, you're going to be destroyed. And so people think, well, God's actively destroying people. No, He's actually trying to protect people. So we live under a new covenant that is established upon better promises. Hallelujah. So under the new covenant, we no longer have to read a list of laws. We have God's laws written on the inside. They're all condensed to two things. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
Paul said you can hang all the law and the prophets on these two saints. So they're written in your heart. So love, if you follow love, you're not going to covet what your neighbor has. You're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to hate your neighbor, right? So we follow the law that's written in our hearts that came there by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given unto us. So we live under an amazing new covenant. Hallelujah. So this sovereignty mentality, unfortunately, even in the college that I attended, university, uh, is in systematic theology. And as I said, it gets into some of our music. It gets into a lot of preaching and teaching, uh, unfortunately, even commentaries. I'm amazed at reading some commentaries, what they come up with. Pastor Carl, it's amazing. You read some of those commentaries, you think, where did these guys come up with that? Especially when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. That kind of throws them a little bit. So I remember uh, John Osteen, you know, he was raised Baptist. And he said, I was preaching, you know, on the gifts of the Spirit and explaining all of the gifts of the Spirit away. And, you know, he said, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, our universities, gifts of healings, our hospitals. And we're not against hospitals, you understand. Uh, he got down to speaking with tongues. You know, that's just, you know, the ability to learn new languages. And he said, I got a, a, a little bit further and I got so confused, I just stopped, threw my hands up. And he said, he said, he said I, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that'd be good for a lot of guys. <laughs> We get to that point, right? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, I miss Brother John Osteen. So, uh, this sovereignty mentality has unconsciously handicapped the church. We become, we don't become proactive in what we do, in prayer or exercising our authority. We think, well, I'm waiting for God to do something. I'm waiting for a revival. I'm waiting for a move of God. And don't misunderstand me. I, I'm, I'm with you. I want to see a move of God in revival. I do. But, you know, the church as a whole, I'm talking about, we're waiting. You know, I know God's going to move. You know, Wigglesworth prophesied it. He said there's going to be a move of the Word and the Spirit coming together. Greatest move ever. And here we are, still waiting. I've been waiting since 1977. I'm still here. You're still here. We're waiting. So is there something that we as the church must do? That's the question. There is, and we're going to look at that. I want to share some things because I believe that this church and you, there, we have more than one church here, uh, you have been positioned by God in a particular area. I believe God positions churches. And I believe very strongly that churches are the primary way that God impacts cities and nations. I believe that. I've seen that happen in nations around the world that had no light and then God brought someone and they planted a church and it changed the nation. I'm thinking of Brazil. A good friend of mine, he's in heaven. Bud Wright, Bud and Jan Wright uh, went to Brazil, I think around 1980, early 1984, was it somewhere in there? And uh, Bud is in heaven now, good friend of mine. Love Brother Bud. And uh, he, uh, he was a truck driver. Just a truck driver. He said, I, you know, he said, I don't, he said, he said, it can't be my, what they call pulpit etiquette, etiquette. I don't have any. <laughs> and, he, and actually, his, his English wasn't, you know, what we would consider eloquent. But a great guy, loved God. And even his wife said, I don't know where he gets his sayings. I, I was raised in the same city. I don't know where he gets some of his sayings from, but. And so his Portuguese was not that great. He had to learn Portuguese. But... Uh, Bud was called by God to go to that nation in 1984. Today, in that nation, he established uh, 
churches or a Bible school and then planted churches. I'm not sure how many churches they have, three, four, 500, I'm not sure. 50,000 graduates from their Bible school. 50,000. It, it literally has changed that nation through planting churches, preaching and teaching the word. Remember, Paul said, so mightily grew the word that it prevailed. It is only the word that prevails in people's lives and changes them. And when people change, then, then things change in our, where we live, in our cities, in our nation, right? Amen. We have to focus on the right thing. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to people. We're not going to change the world system. We talked about that. That's not going to happen. The world system is being controlled by Satan, and he's going to control it until Jesus comes back. When Jesus comes back, there'll be a different dispensation. He will rule. He's not coming back as the good shepherd. Sorry. He's coming back as the commander of the armies of heaven. That's his actual title. Lord of hosts means commander of the armies of heaven. Why do you need an army? Huh? Yeah. You need an army to defeat an enemy. Well, I thought Satan was defeated. Well, he has been defeated for the believer in the church, but he's not been taken out of this world system. Jesus defeated him and removed him from the church, not the world. He's still here. 1 John 5, 19 says, The whole world lies, one translation says, under the power of the evil one. That's John, 1 John. As far as I know, that's an epistle. That's after the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? Amen. See, it helps when we read the Bible. <laughs> and not just listen to you know, what some people think the Bible says. Amen. Now, let's go a little bit deeper here this morning. I want to take some time to pray. Uh, we talked about, you know, uh, two things about, and, and don't misunderstand me when I talk about prophecy. I believe in prophecy. And I think we need to have more prophecy in the church. Genuine prophecy. There is something to the, what I call the simple gift of prophecy that is necessary in the local church. The simple gift of prophecy, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, brings edification, exhortation, and what? Comfort. There's no revelation in simple prophecy. So people are confused. They think, you know, predicting future events is prophecy. Uh, not necessarily. That's the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge in operation. Prophecy is a vehicle like your automobile. It carries things in it. Prophecy is inspired utterance. Sometimes preaching and teaching, I'll say things by the Holy Spirit, that is inspired utterance. So prophecy in the church is to edify the church. That's to build the church up spiritually. So rising, one translation says, rising higher and higher, like a building or edifice. So prophecy, what it does is it creates a spiritual atmosphere in the church, and that atmosphere increases to the point that God can manifest himself in a higher degree. Amen. Anything that God gives, the devil tries to pervert. He tries to sidetrack us get us off so it loses its power. But prophecy is very important. But I said this about, you know, people that predict things. And, uh, you know, I'm not being critical or judgmental of anyone at all. But number one, we have to understand that uh, there's no infallible prophecies outside of Jesus. Number two, the majority of uh, prophecies are conditional. Right? And so someone may genuinely prophesy but you have to meet the conditions. And if we don't meet the conditions, it's not, it's not necessarily going to come to pass unless we meet the conditions. Right? So, thank God for those things, but there is a more sure word of prophecy. 
We have it right here. Amen? Then, uh, also, we need to understand a couple of things about revival. I mentioned John Wesley's statement and Charles Finney's statement. It's no more supernatural for believers to have a revival than it is for farmers to reap a crop. That means seed must be planted. The seed must be watered. And then the grain must be harvested. So you see that throughout the scriptures. We're going to talk about praying uh, probably starting on Wednesday. There are four things that we have to pray about as believers and should focus on that's praying for the seed. Paul said, pray that the word of God runs swiftly. No hindrances. Do we do that? Number two, he said, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. Number three, he said, pray that a door of opportunity would be opened unto me. Paul asked for prayer. Think about that. In these areas, right? Then we have to pray for rain, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then we have to pray for labors. Jesus said when he saw the harvest, ask ye of the Lord to send forth labors. And then we have to pray for leaders. So those four areas, we're going to talk about those four areas and how we are to be directed by the Holy Spirit to pray, not praying out of our emotion, not praying out of our intellect, but praying by the Holy Spirit. That's why many prayers go unanswered, and that's why many times things are not changing. So we have to have seed, water, and harvesters. And uh, then, you know, we, we looked at Acts 4. We're not going to turn back to that. But we understand that many times God lays it on the hearts of believers to pray and intercede for a spiritual awakening. It just simply means, a revival just simply means you are reviving or bringing back to life something that once was alive and functional and operational. So it seems like, you know, uh, there are times when things start to, that God wants to emphasize something and revive that. So he lays it on the hearts of people to begin to pray that way. For example, uh, the healing revival started in 1947 and lasted till about 1958. Uh, and there were many people, including Kenneth Hagin and others, not just Kenneth Hagin, but many, many people who were praying many years prior to 1947. So we think, well, you know, the healing revival came. We think it was just a sovereign work of God. No, it was a result of men and women praying one, two, three, four, five, six years before. So this is what happens. All of a sudden, we have an emergency. We think we do, right? In our society or in the world. Oh, we got to pray. Well, it's a little late. Now, we might be able to affect a little, but not to the degree we should, because we are playing catch-up. Well, you say, how, how am I supposed to know that? Well, don't you have the Holy Spirit? Huh? That's how you're supposed to know. He bears witness with your spirit, right? He starts showing you things to come, right? John 16, 13, he'll show you things to come. Do we believe that? We should. He'll start showing us we need to start praying ahead of time about certain things, even in our own life and ministry. The reason a lot of things don't happen even in our own life or ministry is because uh, the Holy Spirit is trying to get our attention to pray in reference to those things, and we, we do not yield, and I'm just as guilty as the rest of you. I'm not, I'm not just pointing you out. I'm pointing myself out. I've been there. I've done that. And, uh, you know, we just get busy with life. We get busy with things. We get consumed with uh, the work of ministry, or just life in general. As one man used to say, too many floors to mop, too many hogs to slop. <laughs> and I used to slop hogs a long time ago. <laughs> too many things, right? And uh, those things get in our mind, and our mind dominates us, and it's very hard sometimes to hear, if we're not developing our spirit, to hear. 
He's endeavoring to get our attention. On the inside. See, it's not out here from the outside. God's not a, a physical body. He's not going to contact you through your physical body. He's not a mind. He's not going to contact you through your mind or your emotions. He's a spirit. Jesus said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him, or we could say they that communicate with him, must, must, must worship him or communicate with him in spirit and in truth, or true spiritual worship. <clears throat> so many times he's endeavoring. So people, God lays it on their heart, they begin to pray. So that revival went from 1947 to 1958. And then uh, another move of God came. Uh, we see the Jesus movement. They just released a, a movie, Jesus Revolution, I think it was called, uh, about uh, Jesus people. And that was a move of God. And that kind of led into uh, what we call, you know, the charismatic renewal, where God moved in every denomination, every denomination. Hallelujah. What a move. What a wonderful move of God's Spirit. And then, uh, you know, there was kind of a little bit of an emphasis on teaching the Word. I remember uh, when I first started pastoring in 1980, and I was 23 and single, uh, when I started pastoring, uh, you could take a, a flyer a, a, of yourself, a picture of yourself, and post it uh, in a, uh, you know, like a library or something, and you'd have 30 people show up. Well, try that today. A little different today. And people would come to church with, you know, I mean, carrying like four or five big Bibles, Strong's Concordance, and a, and a tape recorder. They'd come in like this, carrying all, all this stuff. Notebooks, tape recorders, right? Remember those days? Hallelujah. And so there was a move of God, right, for a while. A hunger for the Word of God. <clears throat> then God, you know, uh, desired people to move into a relationship with the Holy Spirit to be led by the Holy Spirit in what He wanted to do. In other words, build upon that foundation of the Word of God. And when you build upon that foundation of the Word of God, He can take us to a different level spiritually. So He's still endeavoring to do that. But for some reason or, or another, there was a period of time that God was endeavoring to get the church to intercede. And we started to. And then, because of, you know, extremes or whatever, it, it got sidetracked. And really, to be honest, uh, there's some things that will never happen without that kind of prayer. Never happen without that kind of prayer. Some people will never get healed without a form of intercession. Some people may not even understand, get to the point spiritually to understand what they need to do without people praying. You say, where's that in the Bible? Galatians 4.19. Look at that with me. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. <clears throat> you know, if you read the epistles of Paul, every single epistle, almost every single epistle, either it's directly stated or it's inferred that Paul prayed for those believers after that church was planted. Now here in Galatians, we have something quite interesting, and uh, I was talking with Pastor Fred about this earlier. Galatians, that word Galatians comes the, kind of the root word for Galatians is the word Gaul, G-A-L. The Gauls were a race of people that came from the north, invaded that territory, which is present day Turkey, you understand. Uh, but we're talking during the time of Paul. Uh, and they invaded that territory, had battles, and lost their battles, but many of them just stayed right there. I mean, during that time, you just can't move around. They stayed, got married, raised families, and ended up living in that area. So uh, it was a, a different culture in that area that Paul was dealing with. And so it's interesting, in Galatians 4.19, Paul said, My little children, in whom I what? 
travail what? Again. Notice that word again. My little children, so he's writing to believers, for whom I travail, whom I uh, travail or labor in birth again until Christ, what? Be formed in you. So evidently the new birth does not necessarily mean Christ is formed in you. That, that means you're born again, you understand. The Holy Spirit's in you. Your spirit is recreated. Amen. You have the life of Christ in you when you're born again. But it just simply means you, you don't have the full knowledge of who you are in Christ. You understand that? You don't have the full knowledge of redemption. Now, some people think when you're born again, you know, uh, you, all, all knowledge about God and who you are is in your spirit automatically. Well, that would be wonderful. And they think you just have to get your mind renewed to that fact. Well, that's not what the Bible says. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Grow. So no milk, no growth. The milk is the basic fundamental foundational truths of redemption. Amen. Who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, what you can do through Christ. Growing up in Christ. So you have to, re you know, the new birth is similar to being born as a baby. When you're born into this world as a baby, you're a full human being at birth, right? You don't look at a child one day old and say, well, they're 10% human. Do you? No. They're 100% human, but they're not fully developed intellectually. They have to grow and develop. Same is true with the new birth. You're 100% in Christ. You're born again. You can't become more righteous. Amen. You're in Christ. Christ is in you, but you have to grow in your knowledge and understanding of who you are in Christ. Does that make sense? So, uh, here Paul said that they might, I prayed again in birth. That means an intense prayer. Intense labor. Men don't know this, but ladies do who have children, uh, it, it is, uh, you know, to bring a child into the world, uh, there's some effort involved, right? Uh, it, we call it labor for, for a reason. It's work, it's labor, right? And sometimes, uh, you know, there's some intensity to that. And so he's using that word to describe the kind of prayer that he's dealing with or using, the Holy Spirit is using him in this kind of prayer. This is not something, you know, if a lady's not pregnant, you can't just you know, say, I'm going to go into labor and have a baby if she's not pregnant. That's not going to happen. Right? It's not going to happen. See, so this is not something you can just create or make up. This is something inspired by the Holy Spirit that we have to yield to. <clears throat> So he said, I travailed in birth again. That means he travailed the first time to get him into the body of Christ. Oh, so in some areas, we may have to pray a little bit more intensely, directed by the Holy Ghost, to get people to be open to the gospel. Now, Jesus told his disciples, you've entered into other, people, other people's labors. That's why some areas are easier than others. See, someone went before the disciples, the prophets and others, and he said, you've entered into their labor. Right? But some people, some, sometimes there's no one there, and you have to do all the work and plow the ground and everything else. Plant the seed, get it ready, right? It takes a little more time and effort, but if you stick with it, you'll produce a harvest. You know, most pastors now, statistics say they leave uh, when they pioneer a church or go to a church, they leave in the first uh, two or three years. But the church will not start growing till the fifth year. So most pastors leave before they see the harvest. That's why Galatians, Paul said, be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you'll reap a harvest. If you do not faint, that word means give up and quit. And that, that's true for everything in life. We give up too soon. We quit too soon. We, we give up 
confessing, we quit confessing the Word of God, we quit giving, we quit going to church, we quit reading the Bible, we quit praying. Thank you. I will. I appreciate that. Amen. Hallelujah. I was in a church one time. I loved it. And there was a lady in the church. She would encourage me. And during the preaching one time, she said, Pop the clutch. I said, I'm shifting into high gear. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. I like it. That's sick him to a preacher. Come on now. So, uh, here he said, I travailed in birth again, 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 until Christ be formed in you. So, if you read every epistle, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, those main four. And then you read what Paul said to Timothy, Titus. If you read all of those epistles, you'll see that Paul prayed. Ephesians chapter 1, we see it, right? Chapter 3, we see Colossians, he mentioned prayer. We see uh, Colossians chapter 1, he mentioned prayer. In Philippians, he, talked, he inferred about prayer. And so in every one of his epistles, the churches he planted, he prayed for them. He prayed for them. So we think, well, you know, we'll just preach and teach the word. If they get it, you know, they'll get it and they'll do something with it. Well, some people will. But Jesus said, when you sow seed, four things will happen. Right? You got to be aware of that. Mark chapter 4, we're not going to go there. But the fourth kind of soil produced some 30, some 60, some 100. Why is that? Well, it, it, and sometimes it's because we're not uh, undergirding the Word of God with prayer when it's being taught and preached. And that's not just the responsibility of the leadership of the church, you understand. That's all of us. We're one together. We're a family. Amen. And <clears throat> So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and here's where, where I want to get. And we're about 11, 18, 19. So we'll, just a few more minutes and then we'll pray together. Is that all right? <clears throat> now again, let me just say this in, in, in kind of a prelude to what I want to share down tomorrow. You understand. Well, let's read this first and then I'll make those comments. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is writing to Timothy who's pastoring the church at Ephesus. <clears throat> And Timothy, notice here, uh, sometimes we just read over scriptures and we don't focus or meditate on them or allow the Holy Spirit to really bring out the revelation of what he wants us to receive. But in these verses, 1 through 8, Paul is talking about prayer and specifically prayer for those who are in positions of authority, but also all men. In verse 1, he said, therefore, I exhort first of all. Sometimes we, we read over that, first of all. So he is encouraging Timothy to make this a priority in your church. Not secondary, not, not an option, not something you tack on, but a priority. We do that sometimes even with, uh, you know, other issues like, and, and I was raised in a church, we had communion quarterly. And so it's like, you know, the end of the service, oh, oh, by the way, we got to take communion. When, and I understand sometimes we add communion, that's okay, I'm not saying that, but we, we have to understand the, the value and the importance and the significance of that ceremony or we're not going to receive the benefits from it. And he said, for this reason, many are sick and die prematurely. You know, that's the only time in the New Testament, the only time in the New Testament it says, for this cause, people are sick. Do you know that? Now, James said, James 5, he said, is any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. They've committed sins, they shall be forgiven. 
So there, though, he's not talking about mature believers. He's talking about new believers. And, you know, many times new believers do something wrong, and then they get into self-condemnation and judgment, and they open the door to the devil. God didn't do it. And so they open the door to the devil. The devil comes in and makes them sick. So he said, you know, if that happens, if that happens, just find an elder in the church, and they'll pray with you, and they'll anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord, and he'll forgive you and heal you. That's all it means. But this is the only time in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 it says, for this cause or reason. In other words, there shouldn't be any sick people. Don't get condemned. <laughs> I'm trying to give you light. Right? If we understand who, what Jesus did for us in His redemptive work, healing is in the atonement. The atonement means what Jesus did for us on the cross, right? His blood, what His blood did for us, redeemed us, delivered us, healed us. Hallelujah. When I saw that as a young 19, 20-year-old boy, when I saw that, I was in my house, and I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, forgive me. I did not know Jesus was my Lord and healer. I didn't know that. No one taught me. And so I accept you now, Jesus, as my Lord and my healer, and he's been my healer ever since. It was just as real to me then as he was my Savior. I did not ask him to save me again, you understand. But I, I confirmed and confessed he was my healer. Hallelujah. And he has been. Praise the Lord. And anytime I've had any problems, it's because I, I didn't, uh, I either made a mistake, did something in the natural I shouldn't have done, or didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. That's the only times. And so I give him the praise for all of that. He is the healer. So, first of all, so that's the only time I said uh, that uh, in the New Testament that it says anything about sickness. So I talked that about communion, the Lord's Supper. So we have to properly estimate or value what communion symbolizes, right? When we take that bread, it does not turn into the physical body of Jesus. But when we take it in faith, what it represents, it will do something to our physical body. It will produce life and health and healing. Amen. So here, first of all, in other words, before you pray for your own family, before you pray for your own church, you see, a selfish prayer is not going to be heard. Right? And most of the time we're praying for ourselves. Nothing wrong with asking for things that belong to you, but you understand, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. That kind of an attitude. That's selfishness. That's not going to be heard. Don't get quiet on me now. Amen. Amen. Now, that's not saying you can't, you know, believe for things that, are, that belong to you in the Word. You understand. I'm not talking about that. But just, oh, God bless me, bless me, and not think about, you know, just let the rest of the world go. Let that country go. We don't need them. Huh? You can't have that kind of an attitude and expect God to bless you or to move and manifest himself. So first of all, everybody say first of all. What is it first of all? Now, do we believe the Bible is inspired by God? So that means then this is not just Paul speaking. Well, that's just Paul, you know. Paul is that kind of guy. <laughs> no, this is God speaking, right? This is the Holy Spirit through Paul speaking to the church. First of all, what? Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now under the Old Covenant, Prayer was focused on Israel, and I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for Israel at all. I'm not saying that. But under the Old Covenant, that Israel was, really we'd call them, you know, uh, really the church in the Old Covenant. Right? If you wanted to become a follower of God, you had to convert to Judaism. 
That's the way it was in the Old Covenant. So uh, Israel was God's chosen people. They were to represent God to the world. Now under the New Covenant, we pray for all men. Because not, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Hallelujah. So we focus now on all men. We're not, we're not, you know, we don't just focus in on one group. Lord bless me, you know, my family, us four, no more. We just don't focus in on one group. We just don't pray for believers only, all men. So that's why Paul lists all these kinds of prayers. Because it takes different kinds of prayers to pray for all men. You don't pray the same way for unbelievers as you pray for believers. Now, so here, let's go on reading. For kings and for all who are in authority, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Underline that or highlight that or make a note of that. That we, that's the church, we might live a quiet and peaceable life. Well, is he talking about heaven? No. No, he's not talking about our life in heaven. Obviously, our life in heaven is going to be quiet and peaceable. <laughs> he's talking about here, right now. Right? And you got to understand, when Paul wrote this, they were living under Roman rule under occupation. You know, for some reason, I don't know why, but Christians think, you know, everything has to be hunky-dory or God can't do anything. <laughs> right? Every, and then we get, a, you know, I mean, just a little bump in the road, just a bump, speed bump. Oh, my Lord, the end of the world's coming. <laughs> when just moved to other countries, it's all speed bumps. There's no smooth sailing anywhere, and God's still moving, actually moving probably in a greater way in some of those nations. Amen. It's just human nature. We get comfortable, right? And un unfortunately, comfort sometimes and convenience can be an enemy to us. It's like the man who, you know, he was backslidden and got away from God in his life. He got kind of cold towards the things of God, and so... He's Pentecostal. So he got down one, one night in his bedroom, started praying, Oh, Lord, stir me. Oh, Lord, stir me. After about three days, you know, he had three or four major ch tests and challenges that came into his life, major. And, you know, he got back into fellowship with God, not because of that. And so then he got, you know, over time, he got lukewarm again. He got down on his knees and started praying, Oh, Lord, st stir me. And he stopped. He said, No, 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 I'll stir myself. <laughs> he remembered what happened last time. <laughs> I'll stir myself. And that is new covenant. We don't pray for an outpouring, you understand, on believers of the Holy Ghost because Paul said you already have the Holy Ghost, so we pray stir up the gift. Right? You don't pray for more of the Holy Ghost. You have him. You stir up the gift. That's how you experience more of the Holy Ghost. You stir him up. God's not going to stir him up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a quiet and peaceable life would infer that we can change our surroundings by yielding to the Spirit of God and praying scripturally and appropriately for situations, for leaders, for individuals. Right? Isn't that right? So, uh, you know, like Brother Hagin said, and, you know, sometimes uh, we don't like to hear it, but it's true. He said, you know, if we're not experiencing that, it's our own fault, not God's fault. <laughs> it's our own fault, not God's fault. He told us what to do. Right? You know, and I'll talk about America. Uh, an American, sometimes we get too comfortable, way too comfortable in the church. And we start looking around at natural things. We think, oh, you know, if this changes, that changes, everything will be better. And, and I told you yesterday, or the day before yesterday, this is Tuesday, that what takes place in the natural is influenced by spiritual forces. 
So we, we just only look to the natural. We think, oh, if we can change this and that and all this and that, everything will be better. But the spiritual forces are still there. And we don't deal with them appropriately in prayer. You're not going to remove them. But you can change the effects of those spiritual forces. Whatever you bind on earth, Jesus said, is bound where? Notice it starts on earth, not in heaven. It's not God binding. It's what we do, and then heaven backs you up. What you do in the name of Jesus, heaven stands behind it. Amen? Now, Brother Hagin said this, and I'll, 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 we'll talk about this a little bit more, but Jesus appeared to him and taught him about the operation of demonic forces. And in his book, and I, there's many books back there, I, I recommend all of them, but I don't know if you have the Triumph of Church, you have that one? I highly recommend that. There is one chapter that needs to be read over and over and over and over again, and that is dealing... Uh, uh, was scripturally dealing with uh, spiritual warfare, scripturally dealing with uh, demonic activity. <clears throat> and uh, so a little, you know, a little demon jumped up and down and yakety, 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 yak went like that. Jesus was talking to him and he couldn't hear Jesus, you know. And so finally, Brother Hagin said something to the demon. The demon fell down and, and Jesus said, I'm glad you did that because I couldn't. And Brother Hagin said, nah, I didn't hear you right. And you know how Brother Hagin is. And three times he said that. And he said, you're going to have to give me scripture, he told Jesus. And the great thing about that is Jesus didn't get mad. He just smiled. He said, you know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Lord, your word says. So I want at least two or three. And he said, I'll do one better. I'll give you four. And he did. And we'll look at those later. But then he said this, there are three levels of demonic activity. Paul lists them in Ephesians 6, 12. Principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. These are the ones that we deal with. The wicked spirits, Jesus said in the heavenlies, he deals with because they're outside of our, the realm of our authority. So there is a level, you understand, the, Paul talked about the three, I was caught up to the third heaven, right? Three levels of heaven, Pentecostals, you know, the Baptists and the Methodists. I'm joking, somebody's probably going to hear this tape and say I said that and I didn't. Now, the third level of heaven, somebody said this, John, John Osteen said this, well, you know, Catholics go to heaven if they're born again. Will Baptists go to heaven if they're born again? Will Pentecostals go to heaven? Yeah, if they don't run by it first. So anyway, I had to make that clear. So the third heaven is where God lives. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. That's where the rulers of the darkness of this world operate from. The next heaven is outer space. Our solar, go out to the end of our solar system and out. That's where the wicked spirits operate. You know, there's a lot of activity that people see, and a lot of it's spiritual. We call them UFOs, spiritual activity. It's spiritual. That's why they can't deal with them and find them. You understand. That's spiritual activity. So uh, there's a lot of things we don't know because the Bible doesn't talk about them because it's not important. You'll find out about it later. What's important is to you to keep focused on the commission. And you understand human nature. You start talking about all these things. Oh, where dinosaurs come from and this and that and aliens and all this kind of stuff. And people would just, that's all they'd focus on. Huh? That's human nature. God knows what he's doing. So he, he doesn't purposely reveal a lot of things so that we wouldn't get sidetracked from uh, the commission that we have, focused on him and what our job is. <clears throat> so uh, the third heaven is where God is. The second heaven is where these 
wicked spirits operate. Uh, there was a man by the name of, uh, oh golly, Howard Pittman. And Howard Pittman had an experience uh, similar to Brother Hagin. He, was, he died on the operating table, went to heaven. Uh, I'll not get into it, but years ago. And so the Lord showed him <coughs> demonic activity in the spiritual realm in the heavenlies. And uh, he said he was amazed. They looked like men, just like men, uh, with, with like bodies of, of brass, but men. I'm trying to describe, it's hard to describe spiritual things. But they were highly organized. See, people don't realize, they think, oh, the devil, you know, house divided against itself, can't stand. He's so unorganized, nothing works. No, 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 he's highly organized. He has a plan. And he's been working that plan for 2,000 years, long before 2,000 years. Amen. He was the sum of wisdom, the Bible says. Right? Not just wisdom. The sum, when he was created by God. He walked in the midst of the stones of fire. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but... Uh, he had some significance and importance in God's realm. He was the sum of wisdom. He was extremely beautiful. So he did not lose that wisdom. It was perverted. You understand? So he knows what he's doing. So we have to know what we're doing. We, have, we are not ignorant, Paul said, of his devices. You shouldn't be. You don't have to be afraid of him or his organization because we have someone on the inside of us who's greater than him and that organization. If you understand who you are in Christ and if, if you understand your spiritual authority. Now, here he said we can affect a change. So that means then we have the right, the spiritual right and authority to change things around us, right? We're not going to totally change the world system. He's not talking about that. But he, we have a right in our family, right? In our family, our extended family, and where we operate and function. And if you're planted by God as a church, you have a right to function there. You have the authority to function there. And exercise your spiritual authority. Now, there are laws of the land. We understand that. And we're not telling people to violate laws of the land. You understand that. Paul or Peter said, uh, when anything obviously violates what God says, then that's a different situation. You understand. Whether we obey God or men, you judge. Right? We understand that. But for the most part, if you read what Paul said, and he was, he was encouraging people in Romans chapter 13, not just to, you know, cast off every kind of, natural law there is and say, well, we're not going to obey anything. No, he said those laws are there for the protection of the unsaved because they have no rights in Christ. They don't have access to the name of Jesus or the authority of God to protect themselves. Right? So God loves them just as much as you. Come on now. Huh? Think of the worst person in the world and when we think of the worst person in the world, think, oh, dear Lord, they don't deserve heaven. But you know, God loves them, and he wants them in his family. So we've got to change our attitude. Come on now. Boy, we get upset when we hear certain people's names. God doesn't. Right? God loves them. He has compassion for them. He died for them. Think about that. Think about that. We're not James and John. Bless God, I'm going to call fire down. That's how we solve problems around here. Let's just wipe them out. Come on. And Jesus said, you guys don't know what spirit you're motivated by. Huh? Amen. That's human nature. But we can't yield to that. Cannot yield to that because our prayers will become ineffective. We're praying with the wrong attitude. Amen. We're not praying out of compassion. 
We're not praying out of the love of God. We're not praying by the Holy Ghost. He's always going to direct you into the love of God for people. Now, yes, we may not like things, and yes, I don't like taxes, but I pay them, right? God knows I have to pay them, so he has to provide for me to pay them. I don't know why that's in Romans 13, but it's there. Probably for me, not for you. It's just the way it is, right? We live in this world. God knows we live in this world. He knows what we have to do. And yes, he understands. Things sometimes get a little bit difficult, but we have to understand Sometimes things get difficult because we allowed them to get difficult. It's not God's fault. Sometimes not even the devil's fault. We allowed them to get difficult because we're not acting on the Word of God and praying according to the Word of God. <laughs> Trying to get you to think. All right. We're going to end with this here, I believe. So he said, notice a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty or reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the ultimate goal of everything we do is to accomplish God's plan, which is the harvest, the salvation of mankind. That's the ultimate goal. Everything points to that plan, that program. Everything. Everything. And when we hook up with that plan and that program, then whatever we may need will be supplied. And when we pray for that program, God's kingdom to expand, then it affects the natural world around us. If we're doing it for selfish reasons, it's not going to work. Come on now. But if we are focusing on God's, I want people to be saved, Lord, here in Windsor, in Ontario. I want people to be saved. And so we want them to hear the word of God. We want to have an environment that makes it conducive for the gospel to be preached, right? For people to be able to receive and, and, and accept that word of God. I'm praying that way for leaders to make good decisions for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of the gospel going forth. Then change comes. Huh? Because now you're hooking up with God's plan, not your plan. And God's plan's anointed. Yours is not. <laughs> right? God's plan's already blessed, already anointed, already has provi pro provision connected to it. <laughs> so we might as well hook up to God's plan. Amen? Hallelujah. So, churches have been planted, this church and Pastor Carl and any other pastor here, you've been planted strategically by God. I believe it. Convinced of it. By God in an area to affect change in that area. How do you do it? Number one, by preaching and teaching the Word. Get the Word out by every means available. Every means available. It's the Word, the word that prevails and affects change in people's lives. Only the Word. Right? And then that church prays for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. For leadership. Natural and spiritual leadership. We pray for other churches. We pray, God bless this church, that church. Lord, we want them blessed. We want them to be blessed and grow. Hallelujah. See, when the spiritual tides rise, every boat floats. When the spiritual tides are low, every shrimp has his own puddle. That was not my quote. That's another preacher. But there's a lot of truth there. So we want to see the spiritual tide rise for everybody. Everybody. Just think about every church overflowing in Windsor. Whoa. Whoa. Would that change something? Yes, it would change something. Yes, it would change something, right? Then that changes the atmosphere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The light's going out. Darkness is repelled. You come into a dark room and turn the light on. Where does darkness go? I don't know. It leaves, right? It's, it disappears. Same with the truth of God's Word. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise His. So let's pray together. You can stand. You can be seated. Whatever you want to do. We're going to act on this scripture this morning. Now,
You say, well, I don't know how to pray for, you know, this person, that person, because if I pray out of my head, I'm not going to pray the right thing. Well, I don't want you to pray out of your head. That's your problem. Well, how do we pray? Romans 8.26. Let's put that up on the screen, gentlemen, if we can. Romans 8.26. This is how we're going to pray. Now, you know, Paul said, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my head prays. No. <laughs> when I pray in an unknown tongue, what? My spirit prays. But my head is unfruitful. Right? So when you pray out of your head, you pray with all the knowledge you have. When you pray out of your spirit, you pray with all the knowledge God has. You see that? Now, likewise, the spirit helps. He's your helper. Our weakness, what is our weakness? For we do not know what we should pray for as we should. Lord, send fire right now. Just consume everybody. Nope, not as we should, <laughs> right? Not as we should. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That means in words that cannot be defined by articulate speech. So the Holy Ghost will pray through us if we yield to Him. He'll direct us, right? And if we don't have the words in our language, He will give us words in the Spirit and we'll pray exactly for what God wants. So let's do that right now. We're going to pray for leaders, uh, not just natural leaders, but spiritual leaders, every church here in Windsor. Amen. We thank God for the leadership of this city, the mayor of this city and city council or whatever. We thank God for them and we pray for them that God will bless them, right? Amen. We want to see God's blessings come. Hallelujah. Father, we lift our voices right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Your word says, first of all, first of all, first of all, first of all, we pray for all men, Father. Hallelujah. All men, Father. Hallelujah. For those, Father, in positions of authority. We do that right now, Father. We lift our voice and we pray, Father, for this city, for the leadership of this city. We ask you to bless them. Bless them, guide them, lead them, direct them to make good decisions for the benefit of this city, for the benefit of every church in this city, Father. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for this city. We thank you for every church in this city. We pray for every church in this city, Lord. We ask you to bless every pastor. Anoint them to preach the gospel. Oh, may they open their mouth and speak boldly. Speak boldly. Speak boldly the word of God. Father, may they have an experience with you and the Holy Ghost. We pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon every church, every church. We ask your blessing upon every church in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord, we do. Mandakai, Mandakai, Mandakai li ila a, O Ramara. That the word may go forth, <clears throat> that the word may go forth unhindered, 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 Lord, unhindered in the name of Jesus. Unhindered, unhindered. Oh, la mande che le vianda che la mande che le viata che la mo e a su rapra di che le ando co e le mi ando coro manambre e le mi asso coro mara pra fiato unhindered Lord yes unhindered unhindered in the name of Jesus oh la manafre e le mi ando coro mara pra e le mi ando coro mam the word of God go forth the word of God go forth. The word of God go forth from this place, from these churches, these churches, Lord, here. Andalia sola, Andalia sola, Andalia sola, Andalia sola, Andalia sola. Maniandole alisi kalamala, ele biala varaman rokota la mari ki abroda, ele biala varaman rokota kalamare prendo robo. Oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, oh, Shandaniaso. Oh, la Madia Dosa, Madia Soda, Elimiando Domo. Yes, Lord, in greater ways, greater, greater, greater manifestations. Ha, ha. Oh, greater manifestations, greater manifestations, greater manifestations of your spirit, Father. Mandek Elivia, Mandek Elivia. Yes, 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 when the light comes. Oh, when the light comes, darkness is repelled. Mendiliando, repelled. Darkness is repelled. Darkness, spiritual darkness is repelled. Mandeke Leviando. Oh, la Mandeke Leviando. Spiritual darkness is repelled, Father. Mandeke Leviando. Akile Ambora Sa. Elevialo Vanaprakia So. Oh, la Mai. La Motore Aora Mai. Elimiala Moroso Lomo. Ala Vanambrakia Soko. Oh, la barquia banda leviando, coramanda, que leviando, colomondo, la mandala. We pray for an outpouring. Rain, rain of the Spirit, Lord. Oh, send the rain on Windsor. Send the rain on Windsor, Father. Mande que levia. Send the rain on Toronto. Send the rain on Ontario. Oh, send the rain. Send the rain on Ontario, Father. Mande que levianda. Send the rain. Send the rain on Ontario, Father. Mande que leviando. Mande que leviando, mande que leviando. Oh, oh, Lord, we thank you for an outpouring, an outpouring. Eliasto, 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 an outpouring, an outpouring, an outpouring, an outpouring of your spirit. Oh, Father, we thank you. Yes, you're moving, you're manifesting yourself. You're moving, you're manifesting yourself, Father. Oh, the gates of hell will not keep out the church. No, 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 no. The very power, the powers of darkness will not, will not keep the church out. No, not from possessing spiritual territory. Hallelujah. Elemiando kula mandikeli. Oh, la makia so. Oh, la makia so. Elemiando kala mana pandikeli viada. Andikeli viada kula mandikeli viada. And the killing me under Kulamanda Kilivianda, and the killing me under Kulamanda Kilivianda, Ola Manda Kilivianda, Kalamati Kilivianda, Elivianda Kulamanda Kilivianda Kulamanda, Ebro, 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 change, oh, change, change spiritually, change spiritually, change spiritually, Father, yes, change spiritually, Manda Kalivia, Manda Kilivia. Manda Kelevia, Manda Kelevia, Malapapa Brondoco, Mambrandeke, Mandeke Popo Promondo Corre, Elebiala Vanambra, O La Manda Cadavanambra, O my, Mandai, Mondo, Eleviandoco, O Shanda Caleviata Sa, Elebiala Vanambrande, Eleviando Curo Moro So, O Bam 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 Brengay Gay, Elelia So. Agege so romo so romo dan de lisa e brande cota brande lo so mandam brambande gromo so. Yes, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, we do, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mandala. Egeleviala Morosa. Mora Arasibi. Glory to thy name. Glory to thy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. Amen. Now, praise God. Let's lift our hands and thank God that He's working, working because we prayed. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, you're working. Things are changing. Things are changing because we cooperate with you. Oh, we cooperate with the Holy Ghost. Things are changing. Things are changing. Spiritually, things are changing that will affect a natural change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Now, praise God. Now, this is what the Holy Ghost is saying. This is the beginning. Not the end, but the beginning of those things which God wants to do through you. 
This is the beginning of that which I've spoken unto your spirit concerning the move and the manifestation of the Spirit of God in a greater way. This is the beginning of those things that you've prayed about and others have spoken about. This is the beginning, but not the end. And so continue to persevere in prayer. Be consistent, be diligent, and be bold to yield to the Holy Ghost and to say what the Holy Ghost is saying. Not what you think, not what others think, but what the Holy Spirit is saying. And be bold to proclaim that which the Holy Ghost has said unto you. And be bold to lift up your voice collectively and to pray collectively, corporately, for the Spirit of God to move and manifest Himself in a greater way than ever, ever before. Hallelujah. And you'll begin to see those things change. Hallelujah. Little by little, change will come. Change in the minds of people. Change in the hearts of people. Change in their lives. Hallelujah. And the kingdom of God will move forward. And the kingdom of God will be enlarged. And the glory of God will be revealed in a greater way than ever before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, we're making change. We're changing things. With God. Amen. Amen. We're changing things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It doesn't take a large group of people. God said, I look for a man. I look for a man to make up the hedge. So judgment wouldn't come on the land. Just one. Hallelujah. We got more than one. Amen. Let me encourage you. I appreciate you hooking up and praying. That's awesome. Amen. Let's, let's continue. We're going to pray every day, but we're not, not going to stop when this week is done. And then sometimes we see a little change and we say, okay, that's it. We're satisfied. No, 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 no. No, every place the sole of your foot treads on shall be yours, spiritually. You want to walk just two or three steps? That's up to you. But every place the sole of your foot treads on spiritually shall be yours. God has already done everything that you need, but you have to possess it. One way we possess it is through prayer. Not the only way, but one way. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Pastor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, there's two things I want to just... Um, bring up before we we go you know now now this teaching if people would go on the website when we load it and go over this thing about 10 times you know i remember i remember brother brother hagan glory to god he was making a statement and he says, sometimes you got to listen to a message 50 times before you get it. That blows our mind. See, we think, man, I, okay, I, I heard it. I heard it. I got it. No, you don't. <laughs> Bless your darling heart. You know something? When things are verbally taught and spoken, you probably get only about 5%. You got to keep going over it until those revelations and nuggets get dropped on the, on the inside. Now, I want to just say this. I got a couple books on that table by Kenneth Hagin. One of them is, is a manual on the Holy Ghost and his gifts. Some of what our brother's sharing, that Gary's sharing, what happens, it's in that book. There's some truths that, you know, he's, he's saying a lot more, but they're in that book. And there's another one I got in the back that I, I purposely got and I, I, I brought because I, I didn't know the flow he was going. But it's called this, beyond, it's called um, Beyond the Upper Room. Tongues, Tongues Beyond the Upper Room. Now that might be about three of his books all in one. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a nugget. I mean, it is full of information. That's a blessing. Now this, 
another thing I want to say is this, because I, I don't, I know, I think I know most everyone, but I remember being in meetings where I had some people get up and share and said, you know, uh, you know, they said, I've been tearing for the Holy Ghost for 25 years and I ain't got it. They were tearing for the Holy Ghost. And the thing is this, we don't have to tarry for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has already been given. What we have to do is just yield and receive by faith. Just yield. And I know sometimes uh, the illustration was almost like if a person came up and put a gun in your back and almost said, stick him up your hand, get lifted, and you're yielded. <laughs> you just are already open to receive. Well, that's the same way the Holy Spirit is desperate after we're saved to get us filled. He wants you filled. Well, he wants the power of God in you. It happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. He was desperate. He, he actually initiated the disciples in Acts chapter 1. He desired when he left that he wanted them there to receive and they had no idea what it was. And I'm saying all this to say, to say this. If anybody wants to receive and you have not, I want you to receive. So if you're here, I want you to come up and I'll pray with you. And because this is videoed, I am just going to demonstrate. I'm just going to pray how I would pray for people because they're watching. People are going to watch this. I know they are. Just by, I'm just believing by faith. But I'm going to pray as though I'm praying for somebody to receive. Okay? And this is what I'll say to them. I said, okay, I said, you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And they're going, yes, I need their permission. So they all say yes. I said, okay, in the moment I lay my hands on you, the Spirit of God is going to come on you. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. So he's present right now. And he wants you feel so. I'm just going to ask you to pray with me. And I'll say right now, Right now, just say, and they all, I said, right now, Jesus is here present, filling me with the Holy Ghost. So by faith, I receive, and right now, there's something bubbling up from your belly, and it's just coming up, and just begin to, just begin to speak that out. And most times, it's just instant. They just begin, because it's there. He's in there. And I'll just say, okay, let's not speak in English no more. Let's just begin to speak in that brand, that brand new language that he's given you. And I'll just say, okay, and they'll just be praying. And I'll keep encouraging. Keep, I said, you hear yourself? They're going, yeah. I said, just keep praying. I said, well, okay, now stop. Because I want them to know they're doing it. So I say, okay, let's do that again. I want you to know that you're doing it. It's not the Holy Ghost making you do it. It's you. You're doing it. Okay, let's do that again. Then they'll start. I should say it so you can hear it. And they'll, 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 they're doing it. But see, what happens is people are watching and they don't know how to start. Nobody's ever really led them. And it's just yielding. Yield and receive because Jesus is the baptizer. And the moment we believe it and yield and receive it, it'll be instant. That language, I mean, sometimes I, sometimes when I do it with people, I don't know that they never prayed in tongues because they do it so quick. I'm like, that's it. Well, I've never done it. I said, well, you would never know. You didn't do it because you're doing it so f freely and easy. And I said, now keep, keep doing that. And every time you think about it, in your car driving home, in your prayer closet, just begin to pray in tongues. Just be, because that's the most powerful prayer God gives you. Hallelujah. Now, is there anybody out there that, that has not received and, and, they, and they want it? Is there anyone? Praise the Lord. We all, we're all good. We're all good? Okay. Okay. Hallelujah. Well, you know something? Thank you very much for coming. I, I just... I just saw uh, uh, this. This is uh, this is powerful. I, I'm telling you, it, it probably probably one of the best teachings that I've heard in a long time. Praise God. I, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad he showed up. <laughs> this was this was just so excellent. My goodness, I, I'm gonna go back and listen because there's some nuggets he said. And I'm thinking, man, oh God, I got to get that in me so I can also share and make it easy for people.
Hallelujah. Anyway, Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that these deposits and these downloads, Father, that they'll continue, Lord, to be stirred up on the inside, that, Lord, you will give us wisdom and revelation and understanding of those truths, that we'll be able to walk in them in a greater dimension, in a greater way, to affect the body of Christ and affect those that are in the world that don't even know you. Father, this is truths that will truly set the captive free. So, Lord, we give you thanks and we praise you for all that was said, all that was done. We thank you, Lord, for the atmosphere in this place. And, Lord, for even those those spiritual forces, Father, the, 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 the Spirit of God being able to go freely into the marketplace and into our city and community, challenging not only the body of Christ, but drawing the unsaved and even our children that have been wayward and lost, that are prodigals, that they're coming back. Lord, through the eye of faith, we see it. We see them coming. The children that have been that once knew you, many of the many people, Lord, that we talked to said, I knew the Lord. One time I knew him, but I walked away. But Father, we're calling them back. Holy Ghost, we're giving you permission. We're sending and right now angels, ministering spirits, go forth and draw them here, draw them in, bring all that you desire, all that you've prepared for this time, bring them so they can hear the uncompromised word of God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.